They call him Captain Fantastic, and he's quite simply one of the greatest rock performers of our time. For more than two decades, Elton John has dominated pop charts around the world. And if you've ever been fortunate enough to see him live, then I'm sure you'd agree he is virtually without equal when it comes to turning a concert into an event. This week, some 40,000 New Zealanders will get the chance to witness this phenomenon firsthand when Elton plays his only New Zealand show in Auckland. But the Elton who will take the stage at the Mount Smart Stadium is not the same man who performed here in 1990. Today, there's a new Elton John, as I found out when I met him recently in Los Angeles. As most people know, I don't drink and I don't take drugs, and that's been over two and a half years. Um, and that's changed my life considerably because um, I was a huge addict. Uh, I mean, I Elton John, the man who's made a career out of reinventing himself to suit the changing times, clean and sober in the 90s. I, I realise how lucky and grateful I am to have my health after all that I did to myself. You know, I keep a very, a very rigorous schedule, but my schedule is all around my health, uh, my spiritual well-being, um, and, and really trying to stay clean and uh, I love this new life. I mean, I never knew life could be as good as this. Wake up at night and pinch yourself and say, is this real? Have I really made it this far? Um, ooh, good question. Um, sometimes uh, I don't like it and, um, and I, I, about being, you know, the whole thing about the fame thing. Uh, as I get older, I like it less. Um, when I was younger, I liked it more because it's exciting. Um, I like what I do. I like writing and I like singing and I like playing. But the, the extracurricular stuff that goes along with it, um, as I get older, I like it less. I think I'm a fairly nice person, uh, but when I was on drugs or I d uh, drinking a lot, I was very irresponsible and nobody knew from one minute to the next how I was going to be. And I heard a lot of people that I loved uh, a lot. My mother moved countries. She left England. She went and moved to Spain. She said, I'm off. Um, and I could hardly blame her. Uh, but most of all, I helped myself. And, um, and, I, and, and that shame, you know, when, you th when you're purging yourself with your fingers down your throat, when you're eating, when you're doing grams of Coke, and when you're doing two bowls of scotch a night, you don't have much self-esteem. Mm. And then you have to go on stage and pretend that you do. And so that makes you even more ashamed of yourself, saying, what kind of life am I living here? What am I doing? I said I was bisexual in 1976. And most people knew that that involved going to bed with men as well as women, uh, more, more men than women. Then I got married and I changed my lifestyle. Um, or I thought I was going to change my lifestyle. But uh, when you're an addict and when you, uh, when you use drugs and alcohol, um, it didn't really change anything. Um, I think I got married to try and make my life better. And um, of course, the, the whole root of the problem was the fact that um, I had an immense problem that I wouldn't deal with. And I just shoved that to the side and think, thinking that the marriage would cure everything. And unfortunately, it didn't. Oh yeah, uh, I went through. I went to hospital in Chicago in uh, in when was it? 1990, and uh, I went stay for six weeks. I was a bulimic. I was grossly overweight. Um, I'm a what they call a compulsive overeater. I, I was eating food nonstop when I was when I wasn't using when I wasn't high on cocaine or alcohol. Uh, and I saw so I went in for like four things um, and stayed for six weeks. And actually. It was an immense relief for me. It was, it was hard. I tried to run away twice. But you just took off. <laughs> I, I, I had an incredible problem with authority figures. I mean, I've always have done in my life, and, and um, that was the only problem. I actually enjoyed, once I, I, I decided to actually do something about my health and my, uh, my addictions, I felt better anyway, just to say that, I mean, because I always thought that I could solve all my own problems because I was a successful man in my own field, that um, I didn't have to ask for any help as far as that. I thought I could solve, I, I knew I had a problem. I wasn't that stupid, but I just thought I could maybe do it on my own. And of course I couldn't, and it got worse and worse. When you look back at your life then, the period of drugs and sex scandals and so on, what was your lowest point, do you think? Singing with Rod Stewart. <laughs> no, uh... <laughs> uh Much like oh, some in law no, of the no, country. No, I, just, uh, I don't mean that. Uh, the lowest point, I think, when my mother... I mean, this, but there were lots of low points. Um, that I'm not too happy about. Um, just looking at myself, there, there was a, a, an unofficial biography by Philip Norman last year, and there were some pictures in that book that are frightening. And I look at them now, and I look at myself now, uh, I think, God, I look 20 years older than I do now. And, and the only tangible thing left I had in, in my career was my career, and I wanted to destroy that too. Uh, and I didn't seem to be able to, because at the end of the day, I'm a loyal person, and I wanted to go out and work 
uh, for the people that, uh, to, to, because I employ a lot of people. So because I'm in a way so nice, I, it kept me going. Now for everybody else, or is this for you, for Elton? No, it's for me. Um, I mean, I, and I say that really honestly because um, I've had two months off now between, we've done one leg of this world tour, and now we're coming down to the Antipodes, to New Zealand and Australia, and, and to Hong Kong and Singapore. And I'm really looking forward to going back to work. I'm 46 years old, I do, not, um, I, I do not behave on stage like I used to. I just sit there and play and sing, and, and I have a good time, and we do a fairly long show, and I enjoy singing and playing, and that's really all I can hope to do. Um, I got nervous about the first few shows of the tour, well, to be honest, the first two or three weeks and when we started last May, I was very, very still hesitant and nervous. It was like starting over again. Does that hurt? A bit. I mean, but I mean, I face bigger things than this in my life. I mean, once you get, once you beat the, the or, or you stop using drugs and you, you, try, you get a hand on your addiction, nothing that's thrown at you anymore can, um, can really hurt that much. And Gary, uh, I mean, I'm surprised. Uh, I mean, Gary was was always treated very well. I, I, don't, I haven't read it, and I don't, I don't intend to read it, um, because it's, um, it, it's really not that much important. I can't stop it, and if people want to read it, they can read it. Um, yeah. And I don't mind. I mean, as far as, as far as that goes, I'm just going to Australia and New Zealand to play and to, to perform, and I can't stop that sort of thing. One of the rumours circulating down under is that you went to Atlanta. We know that you have a house there, but in fact, it was said that you were there for treatment for AIDS. Have you been tested? Are you HIV positive? Oh, the, well, there was this program in, in America called, um, is it hard copy or something like that? They, they asked me to do an interview and I said, no, we've done all our interviews. And they said, well, if you don't do an interview, we're going to tell, you the, tell everybody that you went to, um, to Atlanta for this. There's, a, there's, a, there's an Center for Disease uh, Control in Atlanta. Um, and they threatened to come into my building that I live in, and they threatened to buzz me with a helicopter, which they did. Um, and we, so we sued them, and they dropped it like a hot, hot bricks. I ha I'm tested on a regular basis. I am not HIV positive. I have lots of friends who are, and I intend to do something for them um, and do concerts and raise money for those people who are less fortunate than themselves, but I'm not. But you can't stop those rumors around. Um, I had a hair transplant, and that worked okay. And then I was just fell out with wearing hats, and I thought, I just picked up a magazine and saw this thing. I thought, I'm going to go for it. Um, and it's like people have facelifts. And people are very vain in my profession. And I'm, I'm vain too. I mean, I'm trying to get old as, uh, and look as best as I can as I get old. So would you ever have a facelift? No, I haven't had a facelift, but yeah. I know plenty of people that do. And it's kind of my version of having a facelift. And I, I feel better for it. And I mean, a lot of people say it looks like a dead squirrel. And you get all the dead squirrel jokes and the cat jokes and, and all that bit. Can I touch it? Yeah. You can pull it if you like. No, it's, it's real. <laughs> so does it keep growing or is it a... I don't understand. No, it, it's, it's kind of... It's weaved in with my own hair. And then every four weeks or five weeks when my hair grows, uh, uh, my own hair grows, I have to have it kind of tightened up again. Uh, but it's, you know, you do everything in it. You swim, run. I mean, I play tennis every day. I sweat in it. I have it washed every day. Uh, I don't take it off at night. It doesn't sleep beside me. It sleeps on me. You're sharing your life with someone special now. How do you think that's changed the way you are? It's very, it's, uh, it's changed me a lot because this person is very confrontational and they tell me the truth, how they're feeling. Um, when I've ever been in relationships before, apart from my marriage, um, I've always been kind of like a school, little school girl in a way. I mean, I've, I've, if anyone said I'm going out on my own, I've always thought, oh, why are they going out there? They don't want to be with me. Uh, I know now it's okay to be away from someone. If you love them, you have to let them free and let them do, you can't take over that person. It's very hard to live with someone like me because I'm such a dominant personality in the fact that you have to deal with the Elton John kind of business thing with all the people around and stuff like that. So uh, the other person who lives with you, their self-esteem and their, their, their worth is questioned. Yeah, I mean, it's like, what do I do here? You know? um, the person I live with has their own function. They have their own, they do their own, uh, they have their own things in life, uh, which before I wouldn't let people have because I, I wanted them to be with me all the time. That is unhealthy. You cannot be with people all the time and expect to, uh, to it to last. Um, so I didn't just learn, I didn't just come to this conclusion. It was pointed out to me by the other person who I share my life with that this was going to have to be the case. And we talk and, you know, the greatest difference in my life now is I communicate. I don't run away and hide behind a door petrified of the confrontation uh, that, that might follow. You, you ha I have to get, that, get over that, get through the fear of it and then get on with it. And that, that has, seems to be working.
being a decent human being who gave something back or tried his best to give something back. I, I really want to be as philanthropic as possible, to give things back, um, to enjoy, to, to be at peace with myself uh, and to have had that balance which I seem to be finding between my personal life and my career uh, and, and just to be a kind, loving person is all that anybody can hope to be remembered for.